Hi, welcome to Long Lost Friends. I'm Elizabeth Eve King. And I'm Andrea Goyet. Elizabeth and I used to do comedy together back when we were 19. But we lost touch. And a couple of years ago, we found each other again and discovered... I'd become a painter, a performer, a writer, a Pilates teacher, an animal lover, and a biologist. Wait a minute. I've become a painter, performer, writer, Pilates teacher, animal lover, and... Well, okay. I'm not a biologist, but... but we're, we're lost, we're lost friends. friends. <laughs> <laughs> and we're both speculative fiction writers. And my work has appeared in Metastellar magazine. Metastellar, for those of you who don't know, is an online magazine that publishes original science fiction, horror, and fantasy. There's a link below for more information about us, writing tips, and a whole lot of other things. Well, we are so excited to have back with us today, John Wiswell. So John for those of you who don't know about him, has work that's appeared in magazines like Fireside Fictions, Nature Magazine, Diabolical Plots, Flash Fiction Online, Daily Science Fiction, Uncanny Fiction, Cast of Wonders, Podcastle, and Pseudopod, to mention just a handful of them. Um, this year, John's John won the Nebula Award for his short story, Open House on Haunted Hill. So we are just so thrilled to have you back again. And um, we were- but first, show us your pet. Oh, pet. pet. All right. So uh, your viewers may know that I have a, a profound uh, adherent allergy to most creatures. However, I do have this one to keep me company. His name is Squash. Uh, <laughs> I, there was a few years ago, I had surgery and there was a friend of mine who couldn't be there. So she sent squash to make sure that I came out of it okay. Uh, and she knew that I would not stand up to the doctors quite as much as, uh, as I should. So she sent somebody in a bad temper to try to, uh, uh, he, sorry, he, thank you, Randall. Um, he sent this to me to take care of me. And squash has taken care of me ever since. He vacuums very well. Uh, that's great. Yeah. I love that because we never stand up to the doctors enough. We need an advocate. You need an yeah, advocate. We need a vegetable so. to talk for us. <laughs> I always right. think that when I'm at a doctor. Where's my squash? <laughs> <laughs> well, we wanted to, we, we talked about having another conversation with you today and talking a little bit about disability and how you use it in your work and what you like to achieve or what you're hoping to achieve by using it in your work. So if you, not, not just a big chunk there, but. <laughs> okay, yeah. So uh, I myself am disabled. I have a pile of disabilities. I've been disabled since I was 13 years old due to some pernicious medical malpractice uh, that left me uh, bedridden uh, and in uh, chronic pain. Uh, I have constant pain over my entire body and I cannot medicate it. It will not go away. Um, so a lot, so part of my disability is that, and part of my disability is cognitive in trying to process thought and speech and motor control. So you may have noticed on the show that sometimes I do weird things with my hands. It's just me trying to process the body stimuli. Um, it is also actually starting to burn out, uh, nerve endings in my ears. So I'm gradually going deaf. Um, and I am terrible at learning sign language. If anybody wants to help me learn sign language, you just find me at Wiswell on Twitter. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I'm immunocompromised. Uh, so I, I have multiple disabilities that interact with society's ableist systems in different ways. And so I've, I've had very different feelings about disability over the years uh, in the fiction I consume because fiction makes up an a important part of my spiritual and psychological life. Uh, I remember when I was, uh, when I was first uh, disabled, I was watching Friday the 13th, I think it was part two. And there's a, kid, a camp counselor in a wheelchair who gets a machete right to the head and falls down the stairs in his wheelchair. And I remember being like, yes, I'm being treated the same. I can be killed in this movie like all the able people. And I was just so psyched. Uh, and so that began my weird relationship with disabled representation. Um, disability in, in science fiction and fantasy in particular, had, it's kind of strange. Often disabilities are markers of villainy. Um, if not, then they are often markers of pity, and they define the person entirely. Uh, <clears throat> and I, uh, 
I gotta say that 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 can make you feel like you're suffocating as a disabled reader. Uh, it, it's no, it, it's no, there's no edification in it. It doesn't feel like sympathy. It feels like objectification. Uh, I guess a lot of people call, will call the success stories of disabled characters inspiration porn, where it feels like you've been objectified rather than sympathized with. And so what I've tried to do is not write things that are analogies for being disabled and not write things where you magically get cured because you took the right pill or you lived in the future where just nobody has cystic fibrosis anymore. But I try to write stories where people with disabilities are normalized, uh, where just you go on you go on an adventure and you are deaf and then you just have to pay more attention to your surroundings. Um, I, I had a, a last episode we talked to Andrea about the tyrant lizard and her plus one, where I got to write about a deaf woman realizing the Tyrannosaurus that's hazing her is also deaf. And the two of them bond as a deaf, a deaf master or deaf master. Depends, really, they might disagree who the master in that uh, relationship is. Uh, <clears throat> and I wrote another another story um, that was about a Uteraptor that is, uh, has no sense of smell and is missing a limb um, and, and encounters an alien invader that wants very badly to be its prosthetic device. Uh, it's yeah yeah see like that's that's different it's, it's a different uh, it's playing with it it's not sanitizing the disabled experience but it is playing with it in a way that that retains the personhood even if it's of a dinosaur uh, and that's something that I look for sometimes I still write analogies uh, last episode we talked about tank and many disabled readers saw themselves in in particularly in the tank's ability to maneuver surfaces I have been a wheelchair user, and yes, it is a pain in the ass to get around a convention center in a wheelchair. Uh, it, ta it takes a lot. I'm sorry, shouldn't have used that word. Uh, oh, you can use that word. Oh, okay. thank you. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a real pain, especially if the convention doesn't try very hard to be mindful of access. And some conventions are doing much better at that, and, and uh, I applaud them. Um, but so I, I try to, but I, I generally try to have, if a metaphorical figure exists like Tank, uh, to at this point in my career, make sure the literal figure also exists. Because I love it when metaphors for something run into that thing. Um, I love writing, you know, if you've got, uh, don't just make a vampire a metaphor for being gay, make them gay. Like just, yeah, and, and that's, that happens very frequently. And then you get to, you get to do something with the, with the friction between metaphor for thing runs into thing. Um, and that, 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 there's a lot to be done in, in the disability field because disability is so diverse. Being deaf and being a paraplegic are very different experiences. Uh, the disability community, and I'll, I'll pause in a moment, but the disability community uh, comes together not out of necessarily common uh, phenotypical experience. It's that the society is, works in a way that marginalizes disabled people in a way where working, banding together for support improves our likelihood of survival. Uh, and so I have I have great friends, most of whom don't s share most of my disabilities, but I try to be there for them. And sometimes I try to write some part of them that they wish was in a story. In uh, I've got a in my current story. This will be the last thing. Is uh, in the in the current story I'm writing, um, a friend of mine had just complained that she just never sees any diabetics or just casually diabetic. It's always that. Uh, there's no insulin in the future. Like there's only three vials of insulin, and we need to go kill everybody to get it. Uh, and she just wanted like some couch potato amongst the many couch potatoes to be diabetic and just to to check their blood sugar level. It's like okay, that can go in the back. Like and then that one character is that's all their diabetes is to that story, right? That's all that condition matters to that story. It's a different kind of representation, and it it lets you do something different with characters. I think it really helps with humanization, and I love humanizing even non-human things in my story we've noticed yes um, <laughs> do you feel so as you're writing this like you mentioned you you did that for a friend who said i've never seen that which is very cool and you're right it's always they're in a diabetic coma or they're you know that whole thing but um do you also how do you feel it 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 affects people who don't have a disability when they read your your work how do you how, what do you hope to achieve um that's a really interesting question. I think sometimes I'm hoping to loosen the lid of the jar a little bit for them, that they, it, because if you're not disabled, there's a very good chance if you live long enough, you will be. Um, mm. The alternative to being disabled is dying. And I really <laughs> got to tell you, this is the better alternative. I really can't recommend this one enough. Uh, and so 
Uh-oh. I want I want them to be able to be maybe just a tiny bit more compassionate or a little bit or begin thinking about like, oh, right. Those cutouts on the curb aren't just for for my convenience. It's so a wheelchair user or somebody with a cart can get up onto the curb um, and, and to, to look at the world in a way where maybe the next time that you go into a restaurant, you're like, oh, right. Like this is upstairs and there's no elevator. This is a restaurant that is not accessible. Uh, and, and think about that for how you advocate for your disabled friends. You won't recommend that restaurant, right? When, when you go out, uh, because you know that it's, it's built not for them. And maybe, maybe it changed, maybe you even have a word with the manager. They're like, Hey, you know, have you thought about that? Or just in internalizing it and preparing yourself, because at some point you will probably run up against the wall of ableism in your life. And I want to, if I could just contribute a little bit to being emotionally prepared for that. I think then that story's done a hell of a job. Um, I'm very happy to to help people. Um, so that's that's. I think those are those are my thoughts. Those are my hopes when I write disability and get read by non-disabled people. And I will say that uh, abled readers or non-disabled readers, whichever you like to call them, have been pretty not, pretty good. I've gotten not that much flaming hate mail about it. You know, like sometimes you do because of course I'm a I, I'm on the internet. Like of course somebody's a jerk. But like the by and large, even when my stories are taught in classes and I go and talk to those classes, uh, the kids are very receptive. There, there are very few who, who are jerks, uh, which is amazing in any classroom, frankly. If you have like a 75% not throwing things ratio, you're doing great. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, uh, but I, I do think that there's a lot of capacity for, for growth, even at an old age, but especially at a young age in the human heart. Uh, I think, I mean, I think it's so eye-opening being, you know, as an able body person to spend time with people who have something that is a disability. And um, I had a client for a long time who had cerebral palsy and um, she would say things to me sometimes. Like I remember one time she said, oh, I went to the 99 cent store and, but we got the wrong ravioli. And I was like, what do you mean you got that wrong ravioli? And she was like, well, I have to microwave it. I can't put it in a pot of hot water and carry it with my crutches from the stove to the sink. And I was like, you know, things that you just don't even think about at all. Yeah. And, yeah. and as a disabled person, I run into that all the time too, right? Because I don't have, I haven't caught them all. And this is Pokemon. Uh, so, so like, you remember that meme that went around the internet of like, who's buying pre-peeled oranges? It's like, well, people with motor control problems who physically can't do it actually really like oranges. It turns out, like everyone else in the world, they like oranges and they would like to eat them. Uh, and and it's, it's very easy for us to think, like, whatever we see, we don't understand it immediately. It's dumb. It's bad. Um, and, and unfortunately, a lot of disabled experience winds up under that because we don't, we don't have full awareness. And I, I just think it's better when we try to be a little bit more thoughtful. I'm summoning Ted Lasso for the second time in two episodes, but the uh, be curious, not judgmental uh, goes a long way with the disabled experience. Nice. And when we were talking just before we got started on this and talking about this, we talked about um, then also how how you feel and what your thoughts are about when someone is, an, is able-bodied or whatever, we're going to call them, um, and they want to write a story that includes someone of some some other, whether it's a disability, a person of color, um, you know, whatever it is that doesn't represent yourself. How you feel about that? Yeah. Uh, so I'm not nearly as negative on this as, as some people are, and I do understand there are some marginalized people who you they just had too many bad experiences with outsiders butchering your experience or or othering you or making you the villain. Um, but I, I think if, a, if an, a, so I, I call disabled people, abled people. Uh, it's not, to me, it's not a slur. I hope, I hope that's acceptable language here. Uh, but so if an abled person wanted to write a disabled character, I'd say, you know, you have to do the research. Uh, obviously, you, you want to try to get as authentic as you can. But there's also the structures of stories. And for me, this is pretty close to a binary. Um, there's a story about a disabled, uh, about a person with a disability. And there's the story about a person with that disability. So 
you might you might ask yourself, well, what kinds of stories do you want to tell that have disabled characters in them? Do you want to tell the story about how hard it is to be deaf, how hard it is to be losing your hearing, how miserable it is that you have to adapt, that the culture's mean to you? Or because because that that's problematic because you're not in that group and you probably don't understand power dynamics the way that deaf writers do. Uh, whereas a story, you just, you know, like having Barbara Gordon become Oracle in the Batman comics. You know, you, now we have a wheelchair using superhero, uh, the Oracle. And that's awesome. And it's not the story of what it is to be a paraplegic. It's just her story as she is adapting and is a character within the Batman universe. Having a story, and there are all kinds of stories, you know, like you can have somebody on crutches in Middle Earth. There's nothing wrong. With that you can have deaf characters in the swords of genre universe if you want it um and those are great that's the kind of representation i think will help a lot of people and it, it may well be that you know this abled writer manages to reach a ton of people who have the marginalization that they're looking at um and you don't run the risk of being so pejorative by by insisting that you do the issue driven story uh, and it's really great as a disabled person to see representation of chronic pain, in my case chronic pain or immunosuppressant or being deaf just out in the world uh in in, in contexts where it isn't the thing that defines you uh my la just one one trivial example there's a an indie video game called state of decay which is one of many zombie video games and it turns out and there's this one lady on the radio who basically saves your bacon and tells you where to go at the beginning and she turns out to be the quest giver and in the middle of the game, you learn she has lupus. The reason that she's never out in the field is that she, she, with her health, she literally can't do it. But she can operate in this way, and she's much better at it than some other people. So the story never then becomes about, like, oh, it's really hard to have lupus. It's like, we can't do this without March. Like, we need Mar We need to talk to her about X. That's great. Like, that's the kind of representation that I feel like most marginalized groups but certainly most disabled readers I know are completely cool with. Um, and, I, and I do feel, I feel this has generally been my experience when I write sexualities that aren't mine, genders that aren't mine. You know, nobody is, uh, you know, I don't think anybody recently has told me don't write women. Um, but like, it's not my place to go write The Handmaid's Tale. Exactly. You know, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Also, I couldn't do that, but I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't. Um, but the idea of never really having depressing a for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not your style, John. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. but I would never have. I would never have a universe where just there aren't women point of view characters or non-binary point of view characters. Um, and I just and then then from there, you know, you're just taking the leap of faith that you've done enough research that you're doing it all right. Um, maybe you hire beta readers or, or uh, sensitivity readers. Sensitivity readers, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think what you said is really the crux of it is that you don't want to make your characters be defined by whatever it is that marginalizes them, whether it's sexuality, whatever. It's just a part of who they are, yeah. a small that, part. Yeah, because that's what I always, I always have that problem. And sometimes I have that problem on some of the forms it's like where they keep asking me different questions about my sexuality and it's like this is not how I define myself yes it's part of me but this is not the only thing or the biggest thing about me I mean it's like they never you know it's like you want to know about my sexuality but that's not the biggest part of me the biggest part of me if I mean if you asked I would have to say it's probably curiosity and and, and I don't like that when I keep I feel like they want to you know, push me somewhere in this definition thing, whether it's you're gay or you're straight or you're asexual. It's like, maybe this is just a little piece. Maybe this isn't the whole me. And yeah. so that, that I really, yeah, I, I get that a lot. I mean, I think that's, that's a problem with a lot of things is we try and define people by this one thing. Maybe it's the one thing we don't relate to or makes them different, or maybe it's the thing we do relate to with them, but it's still not, most people aren't just, you know, or like, or gay. That's not the most important thing about most gay people yeah. or, or most straight people that they're straight. It's like, no, Small it's, part. it's just a little piece of them. So I think that's that's so important. 
Yeah. Um, we were, I, I'm going to bring this up because again, we, we kind of, for, for those of you listening and watching, we kind of pre-chat a little to sort of decide what we're going to talk about. And this is a little off topic, but not really. And we talked about it ahead of time. We talked about the definition of queer and um, how for Elizabeth and I, when we were back doing comedy, when we were really baby people doing comedy back in the days in San Francisco, queer was a was still a little early on for that, but it was the definition meant you were gay. But now you have taught us today that it has a much broader um, definition. And I'd love you to share it for people like Elizabeth and I who did not know. Sure. <laughs> and, and to be fair, like, like all language, it's plastic. Right, so there, there are some cases where queer still just means gay or, or gay and lesbian. And then in some cases, gay and lesbian and bi or gay and lesbian, bi and pan. Um, but within various queer communities, uh, as other orientations and identities have, have come into the fold, uh, queer is increasingly used as the umbrella term and the monosyllabic umbrella term for your LGBTQIA+, because nobody wants to say quilt bag, like nobody wants to say, and nobody wants to say 12 syllables of just saying letters that the audience may not even know what the Q stands for, usually question, um, is usually what the Q stands for. And so often now the umbrella term is queer, uh, and it's in, in every community that I've been in, um, it's been very positive. I know there was a, there was a period, especially in America, where queer was not a cool word. You do not say that about somebody. Now it's more or less reclaimed. Just and if you just use it as a general umbrella term, it, it works. And you look at things like uh, pride, which often used to be called gay pride, and still sometimes it's called gay pride. But it's more often in the community just called pride because you expect people who aren't just gay to be welcome in the parade and in the festivities that trans people would be welcome at the pride parade. Um, and that sort of umbrella uh, includes asexual people and aromantic people. I happen to be both of those. Some people are one, some people are the other, some people are both. I am the both. Um, Can I ask you then, okay, asexual I get, it's pretty clear, but aromantic is in... <clears throat> Can you be uh, I, like non non sexual, but you like to have a romance? Would be non a a romantic then? Yes. So so the term uh, for being romantic is called allo romantic, um, or that's the that's the scientific term. You're allosexual if you like to if you experience uh, sexual arousal from from engaging in in sexual activities with people. You're asexual if you don't. And there are asexual people who do participate in sex for, for all sorts of reasons other than being excited. Um, but I am, I am not one of those and cannot, I can't speak authoritatively, especially because not, we don't all, agree, we don't all have the same experience, right? So there's, there's different, there are even finer grained differences. Uh, but yeah, so, so aromantic, I don't, I've never felt romantic attraction. I've never felt love in that way. I feel a lot of platonic love. I love my friends very freaking dearly. Um, you know, I, I have, you know, I, I, no, I shouldn't say the things that I, I, I've gone very far to help my friends because I do love them the way that I love my family, except that's not a familial love. It's a platonic love with a, with a deep intensity. Um, but it, but it expresses itself through me in community. Um, other people, you know, you, you have, uh, you know, you have people who only feel romantic attraction to women only feel attraction, uh, romantic attraction to men. Um, all, there's demisexuality um, or, and demiromanticism where you only feel that you uh, feel love after you've known someone for a significant amount of time. Once you, only once you have an emotional understanding. Um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of complications within the rainbow, um, which, which have been really fascinating to learn, uh, especially since I'm outside of all of them. It's very fun to listen to the conversations because they're like, yeah, well, you know, like, no, I'm just like you. I just fall in love with, uh, I could fall in love with any gender instead of just men, you know, like, but everybody falls in love with somebody. I'm in the back room like, no, wait, <laughs> wait, no, I, I definitely put down for the chicken, not, um, you know, and it's, it's, but it's such a varied experience. And what's, what's lovely is that increasingly different kinds of queer people come together to support each other, to validate your your identity to welcome you into celebration 
and to give you space to experiment and see uh, where where it doesn't feel safe, especially if you live in a in a part of the world. I was going to say this country, but anywhere in the world where you might not feel safe, having that community space to find yourself is a godsend. And that brings us back to our first episode, which all of you can check out and should, about um, finding yourself. So it's interesting in a way that you go back. I mean, that's. I think we tend to even when we're when we're writing fiction, there's a, so much of core of who we are and our experiences, obviously, in it, even if we're not doing it as you know as a um, as a nonfiction. Um, so I mean, that core of finding yourself and being welcome and finding that is so core to what you write, John. And and yeah. maybe you know the fact that so many times you personify whether it's houses or tanks or it, I mean, in, in a way that just, it opens it up. It's not like, you know, it's just cause you're not dealing with, and you're not dealing with questions of romance or sexuality when you have a house or, a, I mean, you could, if you wanted to make it a, a gay or straight house, of course, but, but, but that's not, you don't deal with it. And it's just that human connection, that human love that house that so much wants a family and the family that eventually finds its solace um, with this house. I mean, it's a beautiful thing. It's that community. It's really, it is. It's very touching and it's very non-exclusionary. Mm. And yeah. I think both people who were like able-bodied, straight, white, male, you know, they can write very exclusionary stuff, but also people in their little things like, Oh, well, I'm just, you know, because I'm feeling outside or alienated, you know, my story is just, whereas yours or the opposite, yours or this. Yeah, they are. This is an awesome compliment. I just have to say thank you. That's a wonderful compliment. Yeah, they really are. I mean, it's all about inclusion. So it's really, I mean, it's really amazing to think, um, you know, it's that whole... I guess it comes with people glass half full, half empty. You may have as a younger man, because you talked a little bit about this at one point, have felt like it was a half empty glass, but you sure filled it up and decided that you were going to bring people into the fold rather than get mad and angry and push them away. Yeah. That's and that, you know, that itself, that that's such a gift. Gift, yeah. And especially, I hope you're not in pain all the time now. Uh, I am, but. I'm dealing with it. I'm, you know, I manage it as best I can. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's probably a condition that I'll have for the rest of my life. Uh, but to some extent, I've normalized it, and I can, yeah, you know, I can deal with it. I had a, I actually published a story recently for lack of a bed, which is about a woman who has chronic pain like mine. Oh, Andrea's nodding, like, yeah, uh, yeah, no, because I just reread it, and I was gonna say to you that your chair reminds me, the chair you're sitting in now reminds me of the, so of the succubus sofa. <laughs> oh, the succubus sofa, that's the, yeah, I love that piece. Yeah. The pillow, right, that, everybody wants the pillow. <laughs> Every, yes, I want that pillow. I am lucky to have this, this is, this is something that I can sit in. It is, it is a, it is a chore finding anything that I can lie on or sit on. Um, and I am blessed uh, to have people who would help me go from store to store. Like my office chair broke and they don't manufacture that kind of chair anymore. And I can't just order any of them because I literally like I can't sit for more than a couple of for, for more than 10 minutes in most chairs. I'll just sit on the floor or malfunction. And I have two beautiful friends, Kelly Allen and Nat Silva, if you watch this, who drove me from store to store wearing masks, using PPE to shop, to try out chairs, to find something that I could live with. And that's the sort of stuff that keeps you alive. And I'm, I'm so grateful for you. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. Well, I think we should talk about our favorite things. Yes. Okay. Um, Elizabeth almost always starts, except if she's hiccuping or something. Yeah, <laughs> he says, I have my foot so far in my mouth that I can't get it out. <laughs> and I really, I have, I have so many this week that it's hard, but I'm going to go, since we've been talking about sexuality, I will continue that. Male giraffes also often engage, usually, almost always engage in same-sex activities. 
young male giraffes. They court other males, they go through a series of rituals, including caresses and touching the nose, which is so cute. And 94% of all giraffe sex happens between two men, leaving the other 6% for procreation. So it's older dominant males who usually mate, but the young guys are just, it's like an English boarding school for giraffes. They're always, you know, yeah. Do, do um, if I'm, I'm trying to remember, do, um, do dolphins do that too, or do dolphins just rape other dolphins? Dolphins well, that, mostly. latter thing's definitely true. Yeah, I know that. I thought, yeah, the latter is definitely true. Like two, two male will take a, a hostage female. Okay. Well, we'll and older that. females we'll will sometimes do that too, like with ducks. Older females mm -hmm. will join in, like with female societies, like it was older females that always, you know, tied the feet of, you know, Asian, you know, the Chinese foot binding. It was the older women that always do that. So don't trust older women or male dolphins. Okay. All right. Very good and very good. I'm sorry I went on that down that road. Um, I was just reading today that in England specifically, but it's probably going to become worldwide, um, hemp is being grown a lot more now and that it is really good because it is, uh, can take care of twice as much CO2 as a regular forest that size. So they're thinking it can be very helpful. It also is something that is better at cleaning heavy metals and things out of the soil. So they said it's a really good thing for um, restoring crops between like a crop rotation. And if you're not doing, you know, if you're not growing it inside, which is kind of awful and can be a problem, it's really good because it also doesn't take all, as much water. So it can be grown in all kinds of soil and, you know, just one of those little things. It wasn't that exciting, but I thought it was cool. So I thought I'd just talk about it. No, it is cool. And now it's John's turn. So, so my favorite thing that I learned this week is that the voice of Miss Piggy is the same as the voice of Yoda. Uh, Yoda? Frank Oz played both characters. Wow. Uh, and once you know that, if you go back and listen to them, he did an extremely similar voice for both of them. Uh, and I never put it together until somebody pointed it out. Now, many people have played Miss Piggy, but the iconic Miss Piggy voice that most of the voice actors have imitated, it's, it's the same fella as Yoda. I'm going to have to go listen to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I know. Now, so we all, we all leave here. Listening. I'm so, sorry. so John has to go look up the uh, comet. We have to go look up the piggy. I mean, you see, we leave here busy on our computers. <laughs> yes, and we also want to say thank you to Maria and Alex Korloff for producing and editing and doing all the cool stuff you do. Yes, because we couldn't do it. And John, thank you so much. And thank you to our viewers or listeners, however you're seeing us. And um, if you like this, press the button, like it, leave comments, let us know what you're thinking. And if you'd like to help Metastellar, you can visit our Patreon page. We are um, using all the money that comes out of the Patreon page to pay for original fiction. So no one on Metastellar staff gets uh, does anything except volunteer for time and all the monies go to paying our authors so if you want to see more fiction give us a hand so thank you so much and we'll see you next time thank you again joe bye, bye. Thank you,